<laughs> Hi everybody and uh, welcome to Cosmetic, the seminar about letters. I am today's uh, guest speaker and uh, I will talk to you about me uh, and about deck building, deck innovation and a little bit about play groups. Um, I did not prepare any slides like other people did. Uh, I'm too lazy for that. Uh, my name is Randall Rootstam and I play in Stockholm, which currently is the last bastion of competitive Vitas in Sweden, as the other major <coughs> groups have decayed. <coughs> which is a shame, because the other groups are very good, but some people moved to other places and so on and so forth, so, yeah. I started playing tournaments in 2007, and I won my first tournament in 2008. Uh, I won with a 90 card Princess with Obfuscate splashed with Waspex. My star vampires were heroes like Shell Goldor and Cloak and Lucia. And uh, I had maybe 30 plus stealth cards in the deck. And Really no idea how I won that tournament. My brother was a friend of mine called Jens, and he was playing Pander Vote. His deck was 30% kind, 30% bribes, and 30% uh, effective management, basically. And uh, I managed to stay alive by playing my own Be Dreams of the Sphinx, my first turn, and get Folker during the first turn. So I could say no to every single one of his votes from the start. So. Yeah, that's how I survived, and then I won the tournament because the pieces fell in the right order, in the right place. Um, yes, so I'm going to start now with the deck building part. Well, which is basically all of it. Anyway. Obvious to me at least, a very important part of deck building is uh, the amount of games you play. The more games you play, the better at deck building you will become because you get a feel for what works for you, what doesn't work for you, what works in the meta. And, uh, and you will probably have quite a few surprises when you go to a different meta and play games with other people because they will look at you and your deck and say, what, what is happening here? This is a crap card. Why are you playing this? See, I have this counter. My entire deck is filled with this card that none of the people in your other deck plays. So playing a lot of games will evolve your deck building. And if you're the first time in a new meta, you, I mean, unless you do like you does and brings his grinder, which basically survives anything, you're probably not going to do that well. Um, another interesting aspect about deck building is that the more you play, uh, the better you get, and, but it's a little uh, strange on how you get better. Some people, uh, not including me, get intellectually better. They can, when they construct the deck, they, they start thinking, this, this is a good card, I should have this, and this, these ratios are bad. And, uh, I, I do that more now than I did before, but the majority of my uh, deck building skills began with, this feels right. I'm building this deck, I have these cards in the deck. Alright, uh, wait a minute. This doesn't feel, I, I need more of this, I think. This this feels right, I, I will move this. So it could both be a, a feeling of what is good or not, and it could also be a intellectual choice. And the intellectual choice comes much later in my opinion, unless you're really, really Good, like Adam. He's, he's been doing the intellectual choices from the beginning. It's like, I, I don't even know how he's doing it. And it's kind of unclear the evolution. Uh, let me see if I have a good example. Um, the same deck that I won the tournament in, in 2008, uh, when I took it out again two years later to, to play it, I, I, it's just like. This feels really bad. Why, why I have so many Lost in Crowds? Why I have eight Lost in Crowds in this deck? Really bad. I shouldn't play eight Lost in Crowds. Not, 
wait a minute, and ghost in crowds, and five faceless, and I'm not even going to take these many actions. Why I run? Why do I run so many when I don't take so many actions? That that reasoning didn't come to me until much later. Another thing that's really really important in uh, deck construction and innovation is the playgroup that you're playing in. If you play in a very active playgroup, you naturally get better because you get to play a lot of games. And um, there are several aspects that you can uh, utilize in, in, in the playgroup. For example, inspiration or stealing. Uh, when you see somebody play a deck, that you get interested in, that you can get interested in the actual crit or how the deck is run, but you think that the player plays it incorrectly according to your opinion or play style, or you can see somebody play a deck where, which has uh, combinations or um, uh, maybe tricks that is quite interesting, but you think of a way to use these tricks uh, but with a different crit or a different text. Like, I would really like to do this, but I don't want to do it with that. that that's not how I want to build this. Um, one very good example is uh, my Deep Soul Earthmel deck. My Deep Soul Earthmel deck uh, has branded me to some players as a gangrel player. I don't play a lot of gangrel, but. A lot of players think that the Deep Soul Arithma deck that I constructed was uh, very new and inspiring because we haven't seen a lot of new concepts before. It's a tap and bleed. We've seen that before, but we haven't seen it in these disciplines and in this construction. And I got inspired for the Deep Soul Arithma deck, of course, because with the release of KOT, because Deep Soul came in KOT. But I had seen people run vines, run mind numbs, and Street drives and majesties and such, and I thought there, there is something here. Tap and bleed, that's strong. So, how can you play tap and bleed? And then KFT came along, people started trying the different rush cards, just bled and used Deep Song, and again, Jens, who we are very sad that he's not here today, but he's not feeling very well. He has play, he played for a long time a weenie protein deck that kind of built that. I bleed, block, earth meld, equip, bleed, block, earth meld, equip, and continue like that. And then I kind of took the aspects from the tap and bleed with presence and the earth meld, and I thought, how can I do something with this? And Deep Song was a rush to tap. So this, it's an action to tap, and if you block the tap anyway, and you get the untap from the earth meld, and you can do the equipment, so you have the 42. So, and it's really, really, really irritating if you have a Raven Spy and a shit ton of Earth Melts. So, I, I built the deck. It's a very, very, very hard deck to play. <laughs> I played it a lot. But, uh, at least it was new. Not a lot of people have seen, seen the deck play. Another very important uh, thing for deck innovation is uh, the test environment. When you go back to the playgroup. If you play with the same few players every every week, you will naturally be able to put in silver bullets and your decks will kind of start looking the same because you know what's good against them and not. Of course you have the aspect of the collections. If you don't have a big enough collection, you're, you're stuck with the decks you have, but we have for a long time now been practicing the, the, the printed proxies in our league. So, collection is not an issue for us. Everybody basically can play anything and try new things all the time. And if you're in a group with a lot of players that are very good, and it's a big group, you have a very good environment to try new decks, new deck constructions. And I think that is very, very important. Swedish innovation, which uh, people have been saying is a very good thing the last time. Hugh always says that Swedes 
uh, right now the most innovating country. He starts to disappear <laughs> here, but is well, uh, we never, or very, very seldom at least, hide our ideas and hide our text from each other. We share ideas and we get input from everyone. And if I'm at a casual game and in our weekly play groups and somebody brings out a deck, chances are that four out of five players on that table know the deck by heart. Some of the reasons is that they have constructed, some of the other reasons are that they've been playing against that deck so long that they just know what cards are in there. Of course, though, we have players that always want to keep their deck list secret and don't want to sh share because they think it's a part of the game and they want to keep it that way. But a lot of the Swedish players share their ideas and getting input from other people, other good people, is a very, very important part of evolving in your deck construction and creating new decks. We also love to give each other credit. Whenever a Swede wins a tournament, I haven't seen an uh, entry in the tournament winning deck archive with at least one or two, thanks to this person, or thanks to that person, we build this together. Which is fun, because credit should be where credit is due. Um, I'm going to reflect a little now on uh, something I heard in the two previous seminars about what makes me continue playing Vitas and what I like about the game. Um, one thing that I really, really enjoy, and I don't think I don't know if people do that or not, or not is I like to play Vitas Solitaire. I like to sit, when I build the deck and it feels good, I, I like to draw it at least for 30 minutes. Just drawing hands, playing it out, drawing hands, playing it out. Naturally, uh, I have, I win quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Which is very nice, makes me feel happy. So you don't win in 30 minutes, you're... No, no, I, I always <laughs> have the predators that do exactly what I want. I always have predators that always please when I need them to. I always have race and the block, so on and so forth. And um, in the beginning of my deck building career, I built a lot of decks from, from these assumptions. Uh, I, I played a lot of decks that, you know, okay, um, I, I'm just going to say that I won't meet a Dementation Weenie. My character will not be a Dementation Weenie. <laughs> if there is something that can bleed for more than two, with several actions in the first two few turns, I'm probably going to be dead. But if they don't, I'm going to be rocking pretty hard. I most often choose to ignore rush combat. If you want to kill me or one of my decks, play something that runs rush combat. Because I just ignore it. I can handle bleed quite well, votes. Uh, I seldom run run any combat defense whatsoever. I just uh, want to lots of stealth. If they catch me, I'm fucked. If they rush me, I'm fucked. So I usually cons remove that from my deck construction, and that means there's a large amount of card slots I can use to do whatever else I want to do. Which also comes back to the slaughter. I also have a lot of decks at home that probably no one in the stock of have ever seen because I've just constructed them and played them out and played them out again and then I said I will never be able to play this. It was fun. Remove this, this is Very good. Uh, I would like to open the table for some discussion. Does anyone have any questions? So? Well, I have a question for the audience. I'd like to know, are there any other players who do this? Like, uh, play their dream games with themselves? I mean, more than just drawing the open hands. I mean, I do. Hands up, people who do the, I have the perfect game. Yeah. I love playing by myself. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. I like I play with myself. Just so, uh, at least... 95% of the audience likes to play with themselves, and that is very good. <laughs> because Do you have any suggestions for those who are part of a smaller playgroup? Or 
how, how to circumvent the issues? <coughs> well, uh, something that I have been doing a lot, which is uh, people might not be able to, is that I travel, which allows me to see new people, play new groups. That's a time and an economic factor, not, a, not a, everybody might be able to do that. Something that, the other thing that I have done quite a lot, at least in the, my early Aegis career, was back in 2002, 2003, is I was demoing the game to everybody I knew. So I just taught everyone I knew how to play, and in the beginning I didn't do very well, I kicked their asses so hard they cried. But after a year or so, I learned how to demo and teach the game a lot better. So after the first, out of the old group, I think Yuna sitting here is really the only one that's left. <laughs> you know, I think one of the first games I talked to a friend, I played both Pentex and Sensory Deprivation, all of his minions, and laughed and laughed and laughed. <laughs> and then I forced him to play it on the turn, and he had played a little more, and he liked it. He's, uh, I told him, well, you can play this card, the Ruha. You, you can let me explain how you play. You bleed really hard, and if they block you, you kick the shit out of them. And he liked that concept, so he played for a while. And but then he realized that we were all, all that very good, so he stopped playing. Uh, so yeah, if you have, but that's time consuming. Teaching new players, and we all know that this is the a game that's losing players all the time. So maybe now it's more important than ever to try to get people to play and get new people to play. And we have uh, at least four or five new players in Stockholm, which is amazing. We have David, I don't know if David's here tonight, but he's been playing for half a year. And Vitas is a game where you win, maybe win one out of five times. So he's been losing quite a lot. Uh, but that's what you get. Lothar, you had a question? Yeah, I just wanted to add a comment to Otto's question. I sometimes put up five decks in Lackey with four different archetypes and test what different decks would draw against my deck. And I see their hands all around and I can see pretty much what would be going on the first round of the table and I do that again and again. You mentioned that you that very often you don't play any combat defense at all because you don't, you don't want to. Uh, how do you feel as a de this as a deck construction plan? Is it is it viable to just oh I I don't really want people to bleed, so I just skip bleed defense. Well, I don't want them to crush me, so I don't. Uh, I'll, I'll I hope they won't play rush well, combat. Well, naturally, that's uh, a matter of choice. I add it. Combat defense when I went to Finland for no I always did. But you, have, but you have to if you want to. You, I won the year I won Rompicon was uh, not this time but the last year. I added lots of combat defense and I managed to win the tournament. Uh, defending against bleeds is really like you know what they say. Uh, you, you use somebody else's resources to make your offensive better because bounce is so good. So. Uh, ignoring bleeds is, I'm not ignoring bleeds, but I am sometimes thinking that they won't bleed me really, really hard the first turn so I can't get my setup. But I still quite often don't tell my consideration with deflection. I very, very seldom run predicted resources. Yep. Is there some particular thing that you find like, or which you could name to be the most difficult thing when uh, designing a, or trying to build a new deck? I think it's really hard to get uh, the proportions right and the card flow right. Uh, and I think that is one of the reasons that one, some of my favorite vampires is, uh, for example, Umado Ondala, because that helps with card flow and proportion. You can play a uh, a strange uh, proportion, like with a lot of monsters or a lot of stealth. It, and uh, my friend Jonas has an expression that he hates cards. All anything that can throw away a card is a good good card. You know, if he had his choice, he would play a make card which is a monster trifle that gives you two extra discards. 
Nightmares Upon Nightmares does that. Nightmares Upon Nightmares, but then you have to play with mocaps. You remember we talked about that. <laughs> More questions? I have a few quotes here. Oh, we have one over there. Just a question. Do you see them? So I, I've noticed that, or I've gotten the impression that in Swedish myth, at least, there's a lot of, especially in the master module, you sort of gravitate towards, like, here's the, the master module that needs to go in pretty much every deck, at least, uh, like, you have uh, this, this many pen decks and this many blah, blah, blah. And uh, that might be right or might be a wrong, wrong impression. But anyway, if, if you sort of uh, fix, fix in the play group and the meta this idea that this is the bunch of masters that always need to have, uh, do you see that as a problem in, in basically stopping innovation because you've sort of decided, well, these are the best masters I can always put and you never even look at all the, you know, 500 other, other things. Is that a danger? Well, I, I used to think that way. I used to play Dexter Rad at least uh, two of Pentex or Mr. Echo and a Troublemaker and one of the other two. Uh, but nowadays, uh, and depending on what you play and want to play, of course, uh, I've stopped running, for example. I've almost completely stopped running out of Troublemaker because I don't think it's fast enough. Uh, I want you know, instant gratification. <coughs> And, and Pentex and Mr. Rick is instant gratification. Uh, it is a problem, of course, if the meta evolves to a point. For example, now, if you play, at least in, in Stockholm, if you play big caps, if you don't run Crypt Acceleration, you won't be able to win the table because you don't have the speed to keep up with the other decks. So that locks a lot of the monster calls. But then you can do innovative stuff with minion cards or... Sure. Event cards or such. I, for example, am trying right now to make a protein presence uh, boat deck, which naturally runs a lot of Sills Valleys and, and villains, but I run uh, six regions because I run with Akisinia, and Akisinia can use the regions to bounce with. So, yeah, trying to do something there. Oh, I have a few uh, few quotes, uh, or a few stories at least here. It's uh, our friend Jens, who sadly can be here. He had a very, very good uh, way of slimming his decks. Well, at least one deck. Once he had, his, he had a deck box and he took his deck and he was trying to fit it in. Well, the deck box was too small. And it just took, it took the 20 cards and says, Well, if I remove these 20 cards that were on the bottom, that will be fine because I'll never draw them anyway. So, so that's how we went from 80 something to 60 something cards. <laughs> that, that time. Um, and the funny thing about at least the Stockholm group is that 95% of the time you play a casual table, there will be at least one Asimite deck on the table. <laughs> For some strange reason, a lot of the players in Stockholm love Asimite. Because they have dominate. Uh, it's because they can power vote and they have dominate. No, but uh, we have a lot of Asimite Anna Brush decks or uh, Asimite Grinders. I don't know why, but and nowadays the stock uh, our Stockholm League has evolved to a point there that uh, a deck that just runs a lot of wakes is not all that bad. And if an Asimite deck runs a lot of wakes, it just has the same amount of wakes as any other deck. It's not going to be that bad because. Uh, Tap of Bleed was really prominent, so Wakes shifted it to be very popular, and now if you play an Asmite deck with combat with Wakes, you're going to do pretty okay. Uh, but I don't know if it was Kalle who invented it or not, but there was we have a concept that we call the Asmite Earmuffs. Yeah. Where uh, when you play Vites and you play Asmites, it's a good idea to bring these big earmuffs and, and put them on when it's not your turn, and look at your cards. And when people are talking, you don't hear them. That's all good. They can just play whatever they're doing, uh, and then when they try to signal it's your turn, it's like, oh, then you take it off, grab your actions, do your stuff, and then put them back on again. Just ignore the rest of the table. Uh, he found that it was one of the best ways to play because a lot of people try to talk. Well, here he is, Kyle Lett. Put the ass in my ear, Um And uh, I think the last quote I have here is from uh, my friend Walker here. And uh, we were talking about uh, playing Vitas professionally, and he said that 
the only time you ever really felt like a professional Vitas player was when somebody gave him beer to come and play a tournament. <laughs> <laughs> more questions, Marcus. Uh, one more question. Do you, do you prefer powerful cards or versatile cards? For example, comparing conditioning to Murmur of False Will? Or oh, that's a very, very good question. Powerful. It very, very depends on the on the deck in question. Uh, when you play a Tremere Bleed deck, I really want the power. But for some reason, I love uh, Dimitra, Army Brenner, Hector, that, that whole crypt, and now with Dark Selena, because Iron Glare and Scalpel Tongue and all these dual discipline cards are so versatile that you can just, like, what can I do today? Oh, I can do this. He blocked me. Well, then I'll just bleed him for free instead. So, I, I, I like them both. But, but which one, as a player, as a person, which type of card do you gravitate to if you... I would, ra I would probably rather have a conditioning than a murmur. Yeah. Ivan? How long do you think it takes to have uh, a concept, from concept to a uh, tournament uh, worthy day? Oh, uh, How long do you think the, the, the time is for, for that? Uh... If you're lucky, I think that from... Con uh, unless it's... No, if you're lucky... I would say that a deck would be tournament worthy when you're steering it, because it's not only with the deck construction, it's also how much you've played it. So, if you're lucky, I'd say you need to play four or five games with a deck, uh, and that's not including tweaking between games. And you can play four or five games, and yeah, and I guess I am about to quit this talk. Because we have to play this game called Vitas. Thank you very much. I hope you watch more.